This is Black Market Leadership, the underground resource for disruptors and status quo breakers. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our Mission Command series. Oh, I am so excited. Uh, we have a very special guest to talk about a subject which is near and dear to my heart, especially in private, uh, in, in the uh, in corporate America, and that is culture. How does Mission Command uh, interface with culture? Is there a relationship? Do they even mix? So today we have our guest is Joe Labera. Did I say that, Joe? Did I say it correctly? Hey, Joe Labera, how you doing? Labera. Uh, I am great, my friend, and and I am a company now with Donald Vandegrift, the expert of Mission Command. And if you haven't read his book, Adopting Mission Command, you got to get it. It is fantastic. So, Joe, question. First question we're going to lob at you. First of all, what is culture? Uh, how do you perceive culture? Culture is what people do believe in and commit to that is not codified or institutionalized. Culture is something that it requires an internal commitment and buy-in, which in my view is stronger than anything you can codify or institutionalize. So for example, you know, the U.S. Army has a, uh, a manual for everything. The U.S. Army has a regulation for everything. But the, the culture of committing to it and in the ways you express it that's something that can't be codified. That's something that you everybody has to individually buy into and choose of their own free will. You can't compel culture. You can't uh, regulate culture. And when you have it, that's a very good indicator of a lot of, of a very uh, strong level of commitment amongst every individual. So, I, I, OK, so let me throw let me throw this at, uh, at you right now, because I uh, I spent six years active duty. And I, I was part of a great culture and I was part of a fear culture. And mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. There, there was no written, uh, there's no written laws you will fear or you will obey. I just felt it. Uh, I, I think the big thing for us is how do you, uh, is it just the feeling that you get? Is it just from the presence of your leaders? How do you know what kind of culture you're in? I, I guess it just takes experience, right? Yes, it's what people do in the absence of regulation. It's what they default to. So if, like when I was an IG, if you asked me, to, if, if you asked me, if you were the commanding general and you said, Joe, what's the culture of this particular battalion? What the first thing I did, the way I quantified it was, what do people default to in the absence of having a regulation or an order present? What do they default to? And then when you see a pattern of that, then you can articulate what the culture is. You, oh, that, often yeah. people try to identify the culture by one person or one individual, or it's not. It's what they default to. So you have a commander puts out a memo. We got an SOP. We got command guidance out there. But then you get three separate companies, three separate troops out in the field. What are they defaulting to in the absence of guidance from whoever's establishing the command guidance? So, Don, got a question for you now, my friend. Reading adopting, uh, adopting Mission Command, one of the things that you point out in Adopting Mission Command is the, the power of indirect communication, of implicit communication. And he's coming back on. We're having a little uh, difficulties here. Uh, there he is. Don, the power of implicit communication uh, to culture. You get any comment there? I think Don's frozen. I might uh, add. Uh what do you think? So, Joe, implicit communication, is it, is it just, I, I have a feel, uh, I kept throwing this out there. I have a feeling body language, the way you hold yourself, the way you uh, rewards punishment, all these things just add into it, right? Yes. The, a, lot of, a lot about it is, like you said, what's not articulated in the command guidance. Now, you can make your command guidance become the culture. However, that requires buy-in, uh, that, and that's the, that's the challenge. How do you dictate a command culture? How do you dictate any kind of culture? You say, okay, rule by fear. Um, there's a time and place for it. Uh, there is a time and place for rule by fear. Andrew Jackson, with his Army of the Tennessee, 
getting ready to go fight the Creeks. He had many uh, guys who said, hey, enough of this. We're all going to pick up and walk out and uh, go back to our harvest. Jackson stood there and said, I'll shoot the first man dead who does it. Now, that was a culture of fear. However, had Jackson not defeated the Creeks, we'd be looking at quite a different America today. And then he went on to take the same force and turn it into a, uh, a unit that was able to defeat the British at the Battle of New Orleans. So there's a time and place for fear. Um, and there's a time and place for uh, positive reinforcement. There's times and place for all these things. So uh, the, what, you, what, what, what you look at in culture is what you're going to achieve in terms of how you're going to get a dynamic that is going to work together. And what I wrote about was a culture of cohesion. Regardless of where the fear is the mechanism, regardless of where positive reinforcement is the mechanism, whatever the mechanism is, because, look, you know, one of the hardest things of the modern army is uh, when they try to lop on to certain fads and try to make the younger people happy and they think all this, it has to be expressed a certain way. And this is why the Marine Corps and public relations kicks the army's butt, because the Marine Corps is like, no, we're sticking to the tradition. We're the same people who were on those ships who were sharpshooters, were the same guys who held them off at the Battle of Bladensburg, were the same guys who stormed, uh, who uh, went through the wheat at Bella Wood. We're not changing. So as a result, that attracts people who want to buy into something. When you have something that is always trying to, you know, go with the wind, blow with the wind, you don't get people with strong commitment. You get compliance. You don't get commitment. So how do you get a culture of cohesion where everybody's working together, viewing the objective the same way, and viewing the way to achieve success the same way. Because without the whole point of discipline, in my view, and this is what I argue for, the whole point of discipline, which I define as the Marine Corps does, the instant willing obedience orders and respect for authority, the whole point of discipline is to get to cohesion. Cohesion is graduate level. Discipline is high school. Discipline is, okay, we got everybody to walk and chew bubblegum at the same time. Now we want to get to where when the, all the officers had bought it, is what you Kipling would say, you know, all the officers had bought it. One lone voice rallies the ranks. You know, the, the Gatling's jammed, the colonel's dead. One lone voice rallies the ranks. Get up, get up and play the game. How do you get to that level? How do you get to that level where the individual private is just as committed and is just as dedicated as the sergeant major? That's a culture of cohesion. And to do that, you've got to be able to bring their buy-in. And there's a me number of mediums to do it. I think the height of immaturity is to say, oh, well, you can't... Uh, you can't be you can't be intimidating or, oh, you can't be too kind or wish all these paradigms are irrelevant. No, they, they, uh, great commanders used all of them. Great commanders were masters at instilling fear. They were masters at positive reinforcement and they were masters at uh, psycholo the psychological understanding of their troops. So uh, culture of cohesion is the graduate level. So in terms of indirect command, like the mission, the, the, the point of mission command is. I know that given an intent-based order, my subordinates can continue to execute to extremely high levels of effectiveness. It's the graduate level of, of maneuvering military troops, of fighting, it's the graduate level of combat. How do you get to that? And I think unit cohesion is essential because if people aren't all marching to the beat of the same drum and buying into that system, then um, I think they're not gonna withstand the chaos of combat. So I think, I think, I think you have a great point. One of the things that I have always thought about uh, in terms of mission command is, is the fact that when you have your, when you have your, uh, your subordinates, you have to trust them when the fog of war comes and friction comes that gap between expectations and reality, it hits us. You have to anticipate that they're going to act in accordance to your intent, to what you want them to do. So I think uh, one thing I, I, I want to clear up is when I think of cohesion, I think of one big unit, one big like a like a snowball. But the fact is, Ooh. though, your unit can your people can disperse in different ways as long oh, yeah. as they go down that not the not the same lane, the general highway. Is that fair to say? Well, put. yeah, well put. I, I, I don't see cohesion. I'm, I'm, that's exactly what you said. I don't look at cohesion as one big group doing all walking lockstep. I look at cohesion as a simultaneous dedication to achieving an objective in any shape or form. Um, exactly. The greatest work that shows this is Rifleman Dodd um, the, by C.S. Forrester. Here's a, uh, a rifleman in the Napoleonic Wars who loses contact with his unit. 
and he uh, he's behind enemy lines. So what he realizes is our mission, the whole mission of his regiment, was to disrupt the French supply lines. So in trying to get back to his unit, he shoots French officers, he organizes a guerrilla force, blows up a couple of bridges, um, attacks a French supply depot as with, with precision long-range fire, scaring the crap out of him, making him think that there's more guys than there really are, uh, starts the local Portuguese into doing the same way, finally finds his unit again. The sergeant major thinks he's a deserter and wants to hang him. The lieutenant looks at him and goes, wait a second, if he's a deserter, why is his weapon in great shape and why is his kit in shape? He goes, Dad, where, are, where were you? He goes, I lost contact with my unit. I was fighting the French, and now I'm back. He goes, okay, fall back into your platoon. He steps right back into his platoon and goes back to being a rifleman. You know, that's how I look at unit cohesion. That's That, to me, is unit cohesion. I got you. Same mindset. You don't have to, you don't have to walk the same step, the same path. But if, if yeah, you're going to yeah. the common cause and you know, you know, uh, now this is, this is fantastic. Uh, our friend Don is having some uh, uh, technical difficulties. You there, Don? Yeah. I keep getting in and out, but uh, everything you guys have said is the, the the once you achieve cohesion, that means you've you've created trust as well. As well, trust is trust. the glue that bonds us all together. It's the heart of, of mission command, and that's why it's so hard for our system to have a system of mission command because when you have a, a personnel system that causes people to self promote and self careerism, it undermines. Mm -hmm. That should be taken care of through professionalism. The guy or gal's mm -hmm. professionalism, or they're not. The Germans had it met, had that number. They made it so tough to become an officer, for example, that it built the trust from the bonding going through that system from the get go. And then everyone knew that that commission ensign lieutenant was incredibly professional because of the standards that they had gone through. And they weren't industrial age standards. They were decision making, judgment of character. Oh yeah, I think his internet's yeah, going out. No worries, but yeah. So it's the he's absolutely he's spot on. Um, the ability, try, like each little heart, each little heart saying was that trust is the essential uh, trait of a leader, and uh, and yeah, it's the ability. In, in the what he the word I really like what he I want to hit on is profession. You, it's the profession of arms, and I think too often in our military. You, the the mores of the institution trump the values of the profession. So what Don was talking about is the professionalism is key. And the professionalism means utter dedication to the art of what you're doing. You go beyond the science. You master the science of what you're doing. And you get to the level where you're actually doing is an art. And where the, you define yourself. You define yourself with that profession. And I think that's the mark of a professional. The professional, and that's the big thing the Army messes up a lot. It's, you know, a uh, professional shines his boots a certain way. No, a professional doesn't pull his sleeves up. No, a professional looks like this. No, a professional went to this particular school. Wait a second. Uh, this professional has more jumps than you, so he's more of a professional than you. It gets into all these really silly, silly examples. But ultimately, I don't care if the guy's a cook in the chow hall. If he defines himself by, his, by that profession, and this is what he commits his life to, in my view, that's professionalism. And, no, uh, yeah. I, I, I let me let me just add something here. Uh, add something here because um, professionalism. It me to me, uh, and I agree with everything you said. I think at the most fundamental level, it means understand the nature of your occupation of what you're doing. Yes, and I yes. I have to give an example uh, because uh, I, I was a judge recently on a uh, on a on a panel to help uh, these startups get money. You know, the best startups get, uh, you know, 20, 15, $10,000. And there were a bunch of startups who had some really good business ideas, but they was all about, you know, I had one guy who was like, we're, the, the world's in climate change. We're, we're, we get, we got to save water, all this stuff. And, and his, his uh, invention it was pretty interesting. But I asked, imagine if I'm not Gen Z and I don't care about saving the world, how is your thing going to help me? And meaning, meaning, take the ideology away. You're in business. You're about making money. You have to make money to survive just so we have to breathe air. And what's the military about? The military, you know, for, for bad or worse, it's about killing people and breaking things. It, it's not a sexy, it's not a sexy profession. It's a very hard profession. It's an ugly profession, but someone has to do it. And I think today when uh, uh, I've just seen a lot of the army, you know, 
I see a lot of commercials where it seems like the Army and the Marine Corps seem uh, more interested in um, policing. Oh, than- they've fallen. They have yeah. fallen. They have fallen hard. Yeah. Um, the politicization, careerism has made it fall hard. And uh, yeah, and I mean, both Don and I can talk forever about some of the, the clowns we've seen rise to unbelievable ranks. And uh, people with who are completely Jesus, man. When I was in S three, I saw a company commander bungle a live fire so bad, where his units were going off in different directions. They uh, really, they um, one platoon ran in front of an armed javelin that could, that thank God didn't fire. Uh, but then they had to detonate and blow up the javelin because they'd already armed it. I mean, I've seen. I mean, they had almost a fratricide example. They had soldiers falling out of their vehicles, and this was a live fire. And this company commander got a pass because he'd been a general's aide. It, yeah. Yeah. It, it just seems to me that culture, if you're going to have a, a, a good, healthy culture, it has to be aligned to the nature of your endeavor, to, to your profession. If you're going to have a, a good culture for the, for the Army, for the Marine Corps, you're there to fight to win. And that necessarily means yeah, well, killing. They've lost that. They're, they're there yeah. to get a good eval and get promoted. And they're there to do nominative assignments and they're there to uh, – and that, that's where I think they've lost their way because I think a lot of these guys don't really understand what they're there to do. And political correctness and uh, careerism has uh, made our military a very much a paper tiger. Yeah, and, and, and that affects Mission Command. I mean, why – Mission Command – Don, am I correct? Mission Command requires fle- not just flexibility but personal initiative. You have to know that uh, – I have to know that if I'm going to take that chance – and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm disconnected from my unit. I can keep going and not being punished and not be punished by my superiors. I got to know that I'm safe and, and I, that I can do this on my own volition. Is that right, Don? That, that's trust. And, and there is systems at work. We just ignore them because we took the long, wrong lessons out of the industrial age. And then our, our overnight, our ability to form large armies overnight was made possible by mass production, but we never understood. We copied the HR methods that were coming out of a guy named Dr. Chandler out of Columbia in the 20s and 1930s that advocated personal ambition and individualism, which went in effect during after the Doolittle Board in 1946 that criticized uh, the, the system we had in World War II. But the system we had before World War II actually allowed people to stay in jobs a long time and it was a smaller officer corps, uh, but we went to a system advocated unknowingly by George Marshall, who I admire, but he thought we needed a large officer corps that did a lot of jobs uh, a lot of times, knew very little about a lot of things, but could could take over a larger formation in, in, in case of World War III. This is where we came up with the horrible upper out system. Oh, poor Don's uh, his internet's uh, no, I'll pick up where he left off on the upper out system. I mean, Hackworth rails against this, and uh, basically, what it's it's it it does it, it condenses your time in a particular position to where if you don't get the right exposure, you're or or you can still get promoted out of that position and never have mastered that position. Exactly because the va- the values to move up are not the values of the profession, and that's how I was going off on what you said, Don, about upper out. You have right. a small limited time to master that position. So you can may or may not get the exposure you need, but the measures to eval- to uh, push you out of that position may not be aligned with the profession. There was a guy that when I was, uh, when I was working with third brigade, second entry division in the mid nineties, they had me come in there and, and fill in for him. He was the brigade three. He had not been a battalion three, but he was a brigade three because he had been a four stars aide. He looked apart. He always had starch uniforms in the field, but he got me into the vehicle one time after this AR I gave on a, a combined arms live fire. And he said, Don, spend some time sharing with me wh- how you know so much. I said, Ed, I know so much because I've spent my whole life dedicating my life studying every day and practicing and experimenting, making mistakes, which he was never allowed to do. He later became a squadron commander at Fort Stewart. And the rumors I heard about him and through through good, reliable sources and never could find him. You know, fortunately, he got colonel, but he didn't get hired in that. But my point is they promote people off zero defects and their appearances and, and, and how they say things. They know enough about doctor just to 
the sound right, but they don't understand the depth and, and, and the broadening of it. They don't understand the history and the reason or the why behind it. And, and if you're a person that has, uh, uh, if you're uh, self-confident, if you're confident and you're high, high moral courage, you're not going to do very well in our system. It's just a proven fact. I'm not saying they're all like that. There's Brigadier General Don Bolick up in uh, New Hampshire, who's an incredible person. they are guys that make it. The current uh, G1, uh, General Gary Br Brittle is a great man. So there's great guys that, that, that are, get through the system, but by large, they're exceptions back, rather than the rule. And that's why we preach mission command, but we don't understand the cultural ramifications that really practice mission command. They enable people to do it. That means we want subordinates that question things. We want subordinates that uh, are self-confident, that are competent. But to do a system like that, there's no political correctness. It's just who the best person is. I don't care if they're a spotted leopard or whatever. They they are the best people that, that got picked through strenuous uh, problem-solving education, learning to, to be in that position, not rope training and memorization. So, so gentlemen, it seems to me, and, and please, you guys could jump into this. It seems to me that to have effective mission command, you have to have a culture that accepts failure, maybe in the training, the, the training up to the mission, even in training, it's, you have to have a culture that will say, fine, this is a safe place to fail. This is where you learn it now. That doesn't seem, at least in my tenure back in the, you know, 99 to 2005, that does not seem I can remember company commanders fearing failure because that would affect their OERs. I, exactly. Yeah. You, you can't, can't fear failure. You only accept, you only accept failure when it comes to moral uh, decline or unethical behavior, but you don't accept it. Like I, I, I got rid of two cadets that I caught cheating Good. and the system fought me like crazy. Oh, their scholarship. We've got to give them another chance. I caught them cheating on a test. I'm going to, I'm not going to put these people in front of soldiers and leading soldiers in combat. That's no exception. OK, but if you're out trying to experiment with a new concept or a new training philosophy and you put thought into it, at least you could explain it. See, a person that makes a mistake or error through through uh, a professionalism can at least explain what they try to do. A person that does it through stupidity can't explain what they did. Apathy, though. Apathy yes. is inexcusable. And uh, if they fail in something as a result of apathy, I'm done with them as well. Exactly. Uh, and that's where we. We got to define what failure is. Failure yeah, isn't the, the the DCEO of the DCG of support showing up and finding out that somebody didn't have his nods uh, in the right place and uh, da downing the guy to the battalion commander who then screws him and pen, uh, pen screws him on an eval. You know, failure has to be something that everybody knows and understands. This is unacceptable in our organization. Um, wiping out one of your squads when you're a co on a, when you're a company commander on a live fire, that's pretty bad. I mean, that's that's apathy. That, uh, there's some apathy involved there. And uh, but I mean, they need to be allowed to make those tactical mistakes. Like, hey, you put the support by fire in the wrong position. Completely bungled this. That he needs to be able to show. It needs to be able to learn from it as well. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. That's, but apathy is a bad good. thing, and uh, institutionalization breeds breeds apathy because you can rest on the institutional mores. You can rest on the fact that I'm not worried about it. The OC is going to take care of it. You know, I once had a guy at NTC turn around, a platoon sergeant who we were uh, we ended up getting fired, and he left all this gear behind. And he looks around at me and he goes, uh, "Hey, sir, you mind if you uh, police this shit up for us?" <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, this is the guy who I got my battalion, my, 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 oh, my, uh, my zero seven on, um, to, uh, sorry about that. This is the guy who I got my oh seven, my, 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 was Colonel Broadwater at the time became General Broadwater, uh, to go and watch him. I said, sorry, I think you should walk with this guy. He rode with him on the air assault, walked with him on the entire platoon. So after me looking at him, my team looking at him and Colonel Broadwater looking at him, we made the decision. This guy's either going to get somebody killed or cause a war crime. And uh, the, the, what was really, but actually that still didn't resonate with his chain of command. What resonated with his chain of command is he left a bunch of gear on the objective and he told the OCs to go get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Okay. So is Don, Don's back. Great. I guess uh, if I was to ask you, what are the two, let's say I, I am, I'm, uh, I am a total advocate of Mish, a Mish command. I really want to practice it. And I have my own unit. I'm a commander. 
what are the, the two or three, maybe four, uh, I'm, I'm, two or three major takeaways, the major steps to ensuring that we have a culture that can adopt mission command? What do you think, Joe? First thing is you got to have your personal, you have to have a reliable and a consistent personnel system. If the big army is raping your unit every quarter to send guys on different billets, it's going to be an uphill battle. So uh, R4 Gen got really dicked up. Um, you can't have the Sergeant Major Mafia manipulating and moving people at whim. Um, you, it's just like you get a crew, a tank crew set. You got to get an infantry team. You got to lock in your teams by a certain time. I was able to influence my battalion to do that. But in a, um, as a company commander, as, a, as an S3, I was never able to influence that though at Fort Lewis. Uh, it was like, I mean, it was just nuts how you people were pulled and units were broken up. So the first thing is you got to have some kind of consistency in your leadership teams from team to company level. And then now you have that consistency, you need to be able to have a battle rhythm or a training rhythm to where units can, leaders can train their subordinates. Um, I had to go through extremes as a company commander. Um, I actually would do these events where I'd bring the guys in at noon, you know, letting them have the whole morning to sleep in. And then at 1800, we would start training. So I would have a whole night where each one of my squads got to go out and take their squads on missions that my company CP would give them. We called them born again, hard events because it was in the freezing cold at Fort Trump. And we did all this really crazy, insane stuff that uh, was considered very uh, dangerous and risky. And uh, as a result, my, every month, every one of my squad leaders got a good 12 to 14 hours of a suck fest with his squad. And each platoon sergeant had to resource his squads, which were all over four drum. I'd sent these guys on foot all over the place. And every lieutenant had to figure out a way to lead his squads by linking up on his own with each squad. And, uh, and my company CP got to operate as a full company CP, the OE254 and everything. Out of my out of my company office, so that was one example of uh, of how to do it. Is you got to give your subordinate leaders time with their guys, and then the third thing is you. If you're in command, be in command. Um, you, you never should be like, oh, I got to talk to my first sergeant. I got to talk to my platoon sergeant. I got to talk to my sergeant major. Officers need to grow a pair. Um, I understand in Vietnam. You had the shake and bake officers and they rotated in and out. The old salt and CO. Vietnam was over. It's over. It's done. We don't have an army like that anymore. And officers need to be trained and, and made to be leaders. NCOs don't want weak officers. I never met an NCO that wanted a weak officer. <laughs> NCOs want strong officers. And um, the officer needs to be, he needs to be very consistent with what he expects his unit is. It's, you have to be consistent. So consistent messaging from your command, lock, well, lock in your teams, lock in your leadership. Your subordinates need time training their guys. You know, one thing I noticed the MET community, they love these big, big formations where a full bird is talking to a thousand soldiers. That stuff's lost. That stuff's lost. So uh, troops look to their, their, their sergeants. They're not looking to this, you know, so the subordinates, the lieutenants need to practice being lieutenants. The, um, uh, hear me? Yeah, your mic's covered. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Oh, sorry. Lieutenants need to be lieutenants. Sergeants need to be sergeants. They need time to. So lock in the leadership, give the subordinates time, give subordinate leaders time with their men and be consistent in your messaging as a leader. And, um, you got to kind of adapt to your circumstances. Then I would say, finally, you have to adapt. Uh, you can't bring paradigms in from another unit or place. Mm. If you, if, if I come from, if you come from the 173rd airborne and you're now at Fort Riley with a mech unit, <laughs> you're not going to bring the paradigms of that unit. Now these soldiers will still fight and they'll still fight well and vice versa. If you did your platoon leader time at Fort Riley and now you go to the 173rd or the 82nd, you know, you're going to have to adapt to those kinds of soldiers. Um, and the inability of, of officers to adapt paradigms will destroy you in a unit. It doesn't matter how awesome they were in their last unit. T totally yeah, I, agree. I agree. Uh, I agree totally. I, I, I just got to throw something out from the business community. Uh, I totally agree. I have seen uh, I have seen so many smaller companies I've worked with. You know, they use Google 
uh, as their, you know, the paradigm. We want to be like Google. I'm like, you're a small manufacturing company. It's it's a different mindset. It's a different business, and that's fine. You got to learn what is the nature of what you're doing. Uh, who do you need? Adapt to it. And uh, uh, one thing that I have heard. This didn't come from the, I, I read this in the, in the private sector from the military, my, from a SEAL community. I know SEALs are always getting all this uh, recognition, but the one thing that I read was uh, that culture really is localized. If you want to have a really solid culture, it's not these big, airy, fairy words at corporate. It is literally your fire team. It is the four to five man or woman group down here. And when they build that up and hold that and, and you, and you aggregate it, that's going to be your culture. Is that what, do you agree with that? Yeah. Um, and, and this is where I'm very non-politically correct. So I believe that diversity as an ideological concept is bad. Um, I believe people need to all have buy into the same way of thinking. I, I, the, the, uh, an infantry platoon is or a tank uh, uh, troop. This isn't a place where you can have diversity of ideas and thoughts. This isn't a college university. You know, everybody needs to be on the same on point. And uh, if you can't laugh and insult each other, and if you can't have a unit where, that you know calls each other all kinds of names and laughs about it. You don't have a good unit. If, if you got sensitive people, if, I mean, you got to be tough. You got and you got to love your guys. It's got to be a family. So, I mean, you do need everybody to buy in to what you're doing. See, the Marine Corps is good at that. It used to be very good at that. You know, everybody buys into we are the greatest amphibious force and readiness the world's ever seen. We got this story history where we're these frightening killers that will show up and uh, and uh, nobody can break things like us. Um, and we all believe in the same way of fighting. Hey, massive support by fire, tenacious assaults, close, close, close in proximity, mortars and artillery, and then deep fight where we're just nailing everything with Cobras and naval gunfire. There, there's nobody's arguing that. I mean, you may argue the approach to that, but nobody's arguing this is what we do. And I think right. we're the, armed. The organizational with- culture is incredible. They're, yeah. There's different, they're organizational cohesion. That's the academic term. The Marines got that. You know, and when they took off, they didn't have U.S. Marine Corps name tags and no branch, no MOS. That unifies them even more. So organizationally, they got it culturally. What's killing the Marine Corps is a manpower system that's just like everyone else's. It's based on individual rotation, individual careerism processes uh, versus cohesion. We try to implement a, a cohesion program in 2000 in the Marine Corps. I was part of the program, the red teaming program with Bruce Goodmanson and Dr. Jonathan Shea. And uh, we wrote this incredible 260 page document, worked with Brigadier, then Brigadier General Mattis, who was not really for it, but he was the overall guy on that. Uh, well, because the Marines all say we have culture, we all have cohesion already. We have, we have the Marine Corps, but what they're forgetting, like Joe said, you've got to stabilize teams at the squad and fire team uh, level. If you do it there in, in the crew level for uh, for gun crews and tanks, you stabilize those things, they become incredible. The first gunner I ever had was with a National Guard unit in 1982 down at uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia, and the crews were all, all had been together for years. They just shot the, the pants off the regular army because their gun their crews were together and were stabilized and they trusted each other. We, we have this system where we're totally against that. We think they're going to turn into some kind of tribe that's going to be anti-whatever when in fact they're going to be so much better. No, we are. We usually hear the excuses from the human resource people why we don't do this. Uh, and, and, and it's horrible. The history proves otherwise, as the psychological study on cohesion proves otherwise. And we do it just the opposite what science says. So, But, Joe, everything you said, all the reasons to, how to establish a culture of mission coming in, I concur completely. Thank you. This has been a fa- this has been a fantastic conversation. I know Joe. Uh, I think you your time is uh, we we negotiate a time to uh, in your busy schedule to talk to us. So I think at times. No, I'm up. honored. I'm honored. Uh, thanks for uh, putting me into your busy schedule. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, any so two things. Any last words? And two, where can people find you if they have questions? If they want to to to, to dig into your brain, where can they find you? So oh, last- I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook. LinkedIn and Facebook. Okay. And we'll Joseph provide information- Barbera, LinkedIn and Facebook. 
We'll provide information in the bio. Any last words for the audience? Yeah. Um, and also in building a culture of cohesion, you have to have moments of shared extreme hardship and you have to control it. You can't kill or maim your people, but it has to be extreme. It has to be something they haven't seen or done before. It has to be something that wakes them up. If you can't have a team building um, environment where half of everybody laugh at it as a joke, it has to be something that equally kicks everybody in the nuts. And, um, and in, in, in the military, as a violent organization, should be violent. You do need violent. I mean, my shoulder was ripped out of my socket. My neck was, was discs were messed up. All doing combatives. Nose broken, black eyes, uh, jaw still clicks, two broken ribs from my wonderful instructors at the previous school I was in teaching me a lesson. Um, so if you're not willing to trade blows and get hurt and bleed, you really got no business in the profession of arms. And when you have a unit that shares hardships that include that, I mean, I, I remember doing log runs. At Marine, I was a Marine officer before Army officer doing log runs at OCS and the blood was streaming from our shoulders. This, this, if, if there's not blood involved, and I know some people, oh, Joe, it's so extreme, blah, blah, blah. Well, they're a bunch of fat, uh, uh, sanitized people. You're, you're, you're shedding blood for a living. You got to be able to stomach it. And I've seen, I've spent 54 months in combat. And I've seen so many people not ready. Hell, these people had every badge and tab and award in the book, but they couldn't stand the sight of blood. They couldn't stand it and they couldn't deal with it when it happened. And then they shut down and they became ineffective. You have to embrace that suck. It's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual conquest you have to have. And uh, uh, um, it's, it's unhealthy how sanitized our culture is. And how few people you can find who are ready for this. Uh, the old militaries use uh, hunting on horseback. Uh, they use very brutal forms of polo. Uh, they used what did uh, Joseph say about the Romans? Their battles are bloody drills, and their yeah. drills are bloodless battles. Yep. And if you're not willing to push your unit to that level, you're not going to keep men alive. You're going to get people killed. Especially in what technology has done even more is disperse units further. I've got to be privy last year to the the Marine Corps 30X uh, Battalion, which is the new concepts out of 29 Palms, their massive training site. And what we found out that because of technology, dispersion and intensity uh, makes mission command more a factor than ever before. So when I see these new manpower proposals by the Marine Corps, I need to see cohesion and stability and less, less obsession with rank and more obsession with uh, professional sustainment, as Joe was talking about, the ability to uh, understand and know what your profession is. And that's not going to happen when you're in a tour. There's some of, the, some of their battery commanders have less than nine months. As a battery commander, one of the most difficult jobs in the world, and they have less than nine months. Why? To give other people, because they overcommission too many people, and they, they give them all a chance. Oh, that's yeah. the stupidest reason in the world my, for combat readiness. My, uh, you know what? My, I my time as a Marine artillery day. officer, your average battery commander was seven months. I was watching battery commanders switch out at seven months. Your typical artillery officer as a captain, you spent almost the entire five, six years, whatever, as a captain in staff jobs. And I these know, were crazy. the men becoming artillery battalion commanders in the Marine Corps. Yeah, we have it backwards. And, and what's what's bad about it, the irony is all the history proves that what Joe and I are saying is right. And we ignore it. Because yeah, we throw so much Smith. money and technology at it that that's that's the problem. But he's cut out. What were you saying, Joe? Sorry. Task Force Smith. Yeah, that was a, a prime example of an ad hoc task organization, clumsily built, that just uh, got devastated. It ended up just being the battalion commander and the sergeant major with bazooka fighting the North Koreans as they overran the position. But um, it's 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 sad. It's sad. And um, the other thing is the leaders of an organization need to go, especially officers, they need extreme rites of passage. And it's got to be non-subjective, non-subjective extreme rites of passage. So this way, they, it, it's hard to doubt them. Yes. And no, I don't believe there is any school now in the military system which offers that. I mean, maybe Ranger School pre-1995 offered that, but no. Nah. I mean, when you're getting, I'm, I'm sorry, they, there is not one qualification in the U.S. military that you can show me where we can't find someone who has completely let that qualification down. So extreme rites of passage are always necessary and they always got to maintain. They always got to maintain. 
Uh, and it's, it's more, it's about more than PT. And I'm a big, I was a big PT guy for many, many years, but, um, PT is not the definition of, uh, of, of fortitude. It's just, it's, 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 it's the start. It's the start of it. Physical fitness and rugged physical fitness is the start of it. After that, it's something spiritual. And I think we've lost that as a military. Wow. This has been a fantastic discussion. I, I, I had no, I really had no clue what to expect. Wow. Uh, I feel like, I feel like, uh, these past, uh, what 40 minutes have been, uh, a small book has been written. That's why I feel what like did I tell you about Joe before he came on. You were uh, right, Don, you were right. Joe's a stud. Uh, I feel like, he's, I don't he's, know about that. <laughs> I got the teleprompter in front of me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he, well, wrote, you, he wrote some great chapters in the mission command anthology one and two. He really did. Mm-hmm. Well, look, uh, again, uh, we'll, we're going to have Joe's uh, information on the bio and for the audience here. Uh, Joe, I, I'm assuming if people want to ask you a question or two or probe, uh, probe your mind, they can do that so uh, they can contact sure. you. This has been fantastic because I, I feel like I've, I've gone through a course today. You have said things like, oh, oh, oh. You know, all these years in the army, it just never clicked. It totally makes sense. PT as the beginning of discipline. Oh, I just heard bells ring everywhere. That I loved it. I love it. This is a great conversation. Yeah. So, Joe, yes, PT is not yeah. the end state. It's the beginning. It's the beginning. Yeah. Oh my God! I knew so many commanders. It was it was always the end state. No, no, no. You are totally because that's all it. they could do. That's because all. that's all they could do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. They, so, they, they're not the type to trade blows with two instructors in a combative pit. You know, they avoid those kinds of things. Yeah. Oh boy, this is going to be great. I'm I am so forward to looking to the feedback and the uh, the the comments on this section. Joe, Don, thank you so much for being on this uh, this portion. Well, thanks of- for having me. I'm very I'm very humbled and very honored to be in you guys' presence and to be no, able to speak uh, freely like this. Like I told Kevin, I'm so proud of what you're accomplishing and I'm glad oh, thank you're you. on here with us. I think I'm honored to be your friend as well as your uh, your follower. I've been uh, following you since 2007, and I've learned a lot. And uh, Sir, every, every most of what I'm talking about uh, is just basically what I learned from Don <laughs> from 2007 on. <laughs> so uh, the uh, the man is uh, a revolutionary leader in uh, military thought, and um, the, 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 the 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 future will prove the future will prove uh, his words were prophetic. Well, I tell you what, I mean, uh, I finished his book, Adopting Mission Command, and I, I told Don is it's criminal that this book is not being taught the way it should be. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And we're, we're talking about Mission Command with uh, Don here and Joe. And with that, thank you all. And if you have comments, questions, or feedback, leave it in the comments section. With that, I say toodles. Bye. Thank you. Have, have a good weekend. Have a great weekend, everybody. Merry Christmas. Well, Bye. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas to you too, Bye. brother. Bye-bye. If you like this content and want to hear other things like it, head on over to the website at blackmarketleadership.com. That's blackmarketleadership.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast, and you can even create a free member's profile 